Hello everybody and welcome to the first official Dungeon Dad Q&A. I have yet to do one of these videos and I figured it was about time so I reached out to the community on Patreon, Discord, Twitter, pretty much everywhere where people comment on my stuff and figured I would ask you guys what you were wondering about me or the channel. It's not a particularly advanced concept so I'm sure most of you know how a Q&A works. You ask questions and I do my best to answer them. So without further ado, let's get to our first question. From the Hobbyless Wolf over on Patreon, they said maybe a good question to start with, hence why we're starting with it, is how you discovered the wonders of D&D, or just tabletop RPGs if your first wasn't D&D. It's always fascinating to hear people's personal introduction to the hobby. I also got a very similar question from 100% Bean on the Discord, and I would be happy to answer. It's really funny that you asked this, because I was just talking about it the other day, and it was super random chance, is the short answer to that question. Basically, I had been kind of thinking about it for a while, like just checking out things online, but the idea of D&D seemed super daunting to me, because there were a ton of rules, and I didn't fully understand the concept behind it, I guess. I mean, we've all been there before you actually understand how D&D works. You just kind of have this nebulous idea of what it actually is. But anyways, uh, there was a friend of mine who's actually a player in my current game, John, who was uh, hosting a party over at his house. And I lived nearby and decided to just go over and hang out with some friends. Throughout the night, him and another friend of his were chatting about D&D. And I explained to him how I had kind of done a little bit of research and I was interested in checking it out at some point. And John said, well, if you want, uh, our DM Paul is also here tonight. I can ask him if you can play with us. And if so, he'll message you and you can work that out. So I was like, sure, why not? I have nothing to lose by giving it a try. And the rest of that is kind of history. He messaged me over Facebook and we worked out a character that I thought was cool. He was a Raptoran monk named Caldith, was my first ever D&D &D character. And this was in 3.5. So I just kind of jumped into it not really knowing what was going on and had a ton of fun. I loved it, learned as much as I could about the game. And like a month later, I sat down with my roommates and I was like, all right, who wants to play d d It's super fun. And then we started up a campaign, which Paul was kind enough to jump in on. And he kind of was there in case I didn't know the rules for something. I could just ask him, which was very nice. And that was a while ago now. And the rest of that, like I said, is history. Funnily enough, we took a big break from that 3.5 game to do some other stuff. But hopefully within the next eight or nine months, we're going to be getting back into that original 3.5 game. All our characters are like past level 20 by this point. So that'll be really interesting just to kind of dust off my first character for one last adventure. Should be cool. I'm really looking forward to that. But yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, moving on to the next one. Dragon Eater on Discord asks, uh, have you ever ran one of the 5e modules? If so, what do you do to prepare yourself for the session? And do you do a full read on the module before starting the adventure? So to answer the first part of that question, uh, yep, I have run a few of the 5th edition modules. I picked up the Tales from the Yawning Portal, and out of that I have run the Tomb of Horrors, I've run the Sunless Citadel, I've run the Forge of Fury, and I think that's it so far. I'm also in the process of DMing a Tomb of Annihilation game, which has been going really well. To answer the second part of this question, uh, how do I prepare myself for the module? It really depends on what the module is. In the Tomb of Annihilation game that I'm running right now, because that module is more almost a setting really, it's this huge area where there's a ton of different things that can happen, I don't really do a whole lot of prep. I just make sure I have notes written down about key NPCs, what their names are, and just like a couple little traits about each of them. Like they're likely to help the players if this, or they're going to be the opposition of the party if they do this, just that kind of basic stuff. Because that module is all about trekking through the jungle and finding these mysterious locales, so I genuinely don't know where the party is always going to end up. Then when it comes to modules like the Sunless Citadel or the Tomb of Horrors, for example, where it's mostly a dungeon with some story stuff surrounding it, those for preparation because I know where the party is going to go. I can actually do a little bit more prep work with the NPCs. My main thing really is just having NPC names, flaws, and a couple traits. Just ways that I can play off of how they're going to interact with the party when they get to them. And when I know they're going to be in the dungeon, I usually make a point of trying to plan out the encounters. So when they get into this room, this is what they're going to be up against, this is the treasure that they're going to have, that kind of stuff. If I'm being totally honest, my preparation style is probably the least useful thing to anyone who wants to start DMing because it's so left open to interpretation and just improvisation that I can't really give a 
good method for how you should prepare for a session. I actually consider that one of my biggest weaknesses when it comes to DMing is I am horrible at preparing things. I can prepare the world and know a lot about who's in this location, who's in this location, what they're doing and how that interacts with the party. But I usually subscribe more to the DMing school of improvisation because that's what I'm good at. In the cases where I do a lot of preparation, I almost always end up thinking of something that I think is more interesting in the moment than when I'm actually writing out my notes. So there have been tons of times where I've just completely gone against something that I wrote out and I'm just like, nope, 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 we don't need that anymore. This is how things are gonna work out instead. I think the best piece of advice I can really give for planning out modules is if you're not in, say, the Forgotten Realm setting or the world of Greyhawk or something that's already been created and you're running out of a homebrew setting, think about how that module fits into your world. For example, if you happen to pick up Tales from the Yawning Portal and you're looking at, say, the Forgotten Ruins of Tomoa-chan, that is all about an ancient temple dedicated to vampires that's very much borrowed from the Mayan mythos. Which is fine, you can easily just take that and drop it in your world. However, maybe in your world vampires aren't as prominent, so think, okay, well how can I reflavor this to make it work more fluidly in my world? Maybe it works better in your setting as a temple dedicated to an Afridi, so you just change minor details. Instead of having statues of vampires, you have statues of these great Afridi sultans. That kind of stuff is honestly what I spend more time on than almost anything else when it comes to prepping modules for my games. And to answer the last part of this question, do I do a full read through of every module? Uh, definitely not. When it comes to something like the Sunless Citadel, which is a relatively short module that's mostly, again, a dungeon with some lore surrounding it, I will generally read through the whole thing, or at the very least, the big important chambers like the boss room and where you'll find big important roleplay encounters and just kind of leave the smaller rooms open to interpretation until the players actually go in there. When it comes to running a module like the Tomb of Annihilation or even something like Out of the Abyss, like these big long modules that are supposed to take like a few months of play that can span 10 to 15 levels, uh, no. I will read up until about four sessions ahead of where I think I'm gonna be. I'll often skim just to see like, oh, this is where the party ends up if they do this. This is where they end up if they do this because I find that interesting. But I kind of like exploring the game with the players. So when they get to a certain point and we end the session, then I'm like, okay, I got to make sure I have everything ready for next week. So I read the next chapter and I'm like, oh man, that's so cool. And not knowing that very far ahead of time makes me more excited about it, which makes my DMing better, I think, which will in turn make the players more excited about it. So long story short, I'm terrible at preparing modules, so you should never take advice about it from me. Moving on to the next question. From Rock Lobster over on the Discord, is Dungeon Dad literal or is it an aspiration? This is a question I get asked probably more than almost anything else, and I see this pop up a fair amount on Twitter. The answer to that question is no, I am not a literal father of biological children. The name of this channel kind of came about because of what my players used to call me. They used to call me Dungeon Dad kind of as a joke. And then that just turned into this big thing amongst our larger friend group. So when I was trying to think of a name for a YouTube channel about D&D, that just kind of seemed naturally like what I should do. And is it an aspiration? Not currently an aspiration, but we'll see what the future holds. Akira on Twitter asks, what would you want, I presume, your players to do more of during your sessions? This question is hilarious to me because Akira is in fact one of the players in a game that I run. And I think the answer to this question is generally the same for a lot of DMs out there, and it is simply just roleplay. And don't interpret this the wrong way, I think my players do a fantastic job of roleplaying at the table, and I couldn't ask for a better playgroup. I honestly love each and every one of the people that I DM for. That said though, more roleplay is never a bad thing. Some of my favorite moments in D&D are these fantastic character moments that have sometimes been built up over multiple sessions or even like months in real time. I love watching characters grow. Because as a DM, you get that unique perspective where you see them, they send you this message on Facebook or an email or whatever saying, this is my character, this is what they're all about, this is what they want to do, and so on and so forth. And as a DM, you're like, okay, that's great. But then when you look at that same character by the end of a big campaign arc, it's so fascinating when you can see where that character is at now versus where you thought they were going to end up when that person first pitched this character to you. And that happens because of fun roleplay moments. 
It's not something you can optimize. It's not something that you can mechanically build up. It literally just comes down to the players building up their characters, which I think is so fun. And that goes out to everyone. If you are a player in a D&D game, role play more. You'll love it. The other players will love it and your DM will love it. Our next question comes from Jim, the genie, I presume. How do you deal with speed in combat? As in, how do you keep a steady rhythm of play so that combat doesn't take too long? I had a session on Wednesday and my players took three hours to finish a combat that they started with the previous session. There's only five of us and yet I feel like combat takes too long and no method I know keeps it fast. This is a very tricky thing to tackle as a DM and I can tell you right now as someone who DMs for a group that on some days has seven or eight players, there's no easy way out. There are a few things you can do to try to counteract this though and depending on the group you might want to make these options more or less extreme. The first thing is try to make sure your players know what they're going to do on their turn. In any group with more than four people, I think this is an important conversation to have, which simply needs to go as far as saying, hey, try to use other people's turns to think about what you're going to do on your turn and look up any spells you might need to cast so when we get to you, you don't have to spend a minute talking it over or figuring it out. If you have a very large group or you feel like you need to enforce this rule, you can always put a time limit on it as well. Say when it goes to someone's turn, give them 10 seconds, and if they don't know what they're going to do by the time that 10 seconds is up, then just move on to the next person and go back to them if they can figure it out before that round of initiative is over. That can be a little harsh, but I know that works good in some groups. Another thing you can do here to cut down on a bit of time, especially if you have a lot of encounters planned for that session, is at the beginning of the session, have all the players roll initiative, keep track of those numbers, and use those same initiative rolls for the rest of the session. I'm not a huge fan of doing this personally, mostly because I have a rogue in the group, and if she rolls poorly, that means her initiative roll is botched for the rest of the session, meaning one of her abilities, the assassinate ability, doesn't work properly. However, if she rolls high, it means that she's going to be guaranteed that assassinate ability for the rest of the session, so it's kind of a double-edged sword, but it really brings what could be two or three separate rolls all down to one roll. But that said, as long as you clear that with your players and they're fine with it, then I think this is a great way to cut down just on another minute or two at the beginning of every combat. Another thing you can do to speed up the enemy's turn if you have a ton of monsters that you're running against a group is to just use the average damage amount values given in the monster manual. They're there for a reason. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, I mean, whenever you see, say, a bugbear's Morningstar attack, it does 2d6 plus 3. Instead of rolling that 2d6 plus 3, you can look beside it and there will be a number there that tells you the average damage for that attack. In this case, it would be 10. So if you're running a swarm of, say, goblins, instead of rolling all those dice, whenever they hit someone, they just deal 6 damage or 10 damage or whatever that number is. This is a bit of a compromise still because you're taking away the possibility that the monster is going to do an incredibly high amount of damage or an incircumstantial amount of damage, but it doesn't really matter too much because it's just the average amount. It will just make your monsters more predictable. I wouldn't recommend doing that in all combats, but again, if you're fighting a goblin swarm of like 20 goblins, rolling damage for all of those creatures is going to be a pain. So this is a good way to circumvent that. From Goomner on Discord, they ask, What supplemental book from previous editions do you find yourself going back to for ideas the most? And what mechanics from older editions do you still use in current games? So to answer the first part of that question, uh, the supplement that I go back to the most is hands down the Dark Sun campaign setting. This is more personal to me because my current setting is a very desert Dark Sun-like world. I think I've probably mentioned that in an episode before. And there are tons of ideas that I find really inspiring from those books, just specifically with how people interact with each other and what the cities and urban environments are like. I think in general, a lot of the published campaign settings that haven't made their way to 5th edition still have a lot of value because 90% of the stuff in there isn't necessarily mechanical. It's just, here's a city, here's the theme, here's is kind of how it works. So if you look at settings like Eberron or even the older Greyhawk setting stuff, there's lots of good tidbits in there that you can just pull out and place into your world as you like. But for me personally, like I said, Dark Sun has definitely got to be my go-to old school supplement book. And if the rumors are true, we might see a fifth edition version of that book sometime soon. That's probably just wishful thinking on my part, but I'm still holding out that we'll get that fifth edition release. If you're not familiar with Dark Sun, definitely check it out. It's a very unique and interesting campaign setting. And to answer the second part of this question, there aren't really a lot of mechanics from older versions of D&D or even other games that I use. 
Skill challenges are definitely a big one, which I've done a video on and you mentioned that in your question there. So obviously you're aware of that. Um, another one that I bust out sometimes is actually the rules for leadership from 3.5. They had a feat you could take called leadership that entitled you to a cohort and a certain number of followers. And based on a bunch of different criteria such as your charisma score, how you've treated past cohorts, how many people have died under your rule, how many great feats you've accomplished, or how many terrible things you've done, you accrued a leadership score and then you would use that number to determine how many cohorts you could have working directly under you at one time and how many followers you could have on kind of a mass scale. It also determined the max level of those cohorts, and of course your followers were generally just level 0 or level 1 NPCs. This was a super cool idea, and it's not something that you have to use very often, but once in a while you'll have a player who wants to raise a mercenary army, or who wants to found a small kingdom or township, or something like that, and I always find this a good place to go back to because it makes it a lot less nebulous. It's a real number that I can say, based on these criteria, this is how many people you can get to follow you at any given time. Of course, depending on the situation, I'll usually make some tweaks, but it's definitely worth checking out if you've got a player looking to do something similar in one of your games. Next up, we've got a question from the Daddy Slug on Twitter who asks, what's your favorite monster to use in and out of combat? And the answer to both in and out of combat for me is kind of the same thing. Generally, I really like to use humanoid monsters, which I know is kind of a broad answer to a very specific question, but I'll explain. I'm a big fan of orcs, I'm a big fan of hobgoblins, I'm a big fan of giants, which I guess now are not humanoid, they're considered giants, they're their own thing. But the reason for this is because they are relatable in the sense where you kind of understand that they have the same structure of like needs and wants and desires that we might as real people, but they're so weird and different in their own way and when you play up to their strengths and weaknesses, you can make them feel very real. So I love hobgoblins just for the fact that they are this very feudal Japan inspired kind of race that is very regimented and they have like samurai like warriors and they have a very strong honor system and clanship and all that stuff and I think that's great. And I like orcs for the same reasons but because their culture is so different, they're very tribal, they're very savage but they still have some kind of rules or as many rules as you can have in such a chaotic civilization that it makes them relatable but very different. And this is why I love them in combat because they all have similar goals but they all have their own way of approaching it from different angles. And out of combat, it's the same kind of thing. You're dealing with this creature that has a very different society and culture than you do, but it's ultimately someone you can converse with. And that's a very broad and general answer, but if you want a specific singular creature, it changes pretty much every day of the week, but overall the one monster I've always gone back to has been Spellweavers. I think they're super interesting, I think they're very underrated, and I did a huge crazy video about them and explaining why I think these things, so if you haven't seen that, you can check out me talking about Spellweavers for like half an hour if you want. From Shay over on Discord, we've got, what is your favorite fast food and your favorite class and race? My favorite fast food is definitely In-N-Out, which we don't have where I live, and maybe that's why I like it so much, because it's exotic to me. And my favorite class and race is definitely the classic human paladin. I can already hear people groaning in the comments section, but there's a reasoning behind it. Paladins have this kind of trope about being the paladunce, the stupid character with a lot of charisma and a lot of strength, who's just kind of a holy warrior out to do good in the world, and that's where it ends for a lot of people. This was one of the things that made it so frustrating to play a paladin in 3.5 because they are very much geared to be that. And this is why I love them so much in 5th edition because they actually give you options for once as a paladin. You don't have to be lawful anymore. You don't have to be a retribution paladin with other levels stacked on. You can be a paladin of vengeance, you can be a paladin of the ancients, you can be a warlord type paladin from Xanathar's Guide. I can't remember what those guys are called. But the point is there's tons of different ways to play a paladin out there and ultimately it's just a powerful warrior who is fueled by convictions. It's the one thing that the fighter doesn't have, which is a higher purpose as to why they do the things they do. And I think it results in an amazing plethora of role-playing possibilities. When those convictions are challenged, there are many different ways your character could respond to it. And those situations are what I live for when I play D&D. They're so good, they're so much fun. And when they happen organically, it's just magical. 
Human, I know, is a boring choice because you're human in the real world. Why would you want to play a human in D&D when you can be literally anything? And I agree with that sentiment on some level, but at the same time, that's kind of what makes a human interesting, is because despite the fact that you are just a human, it's up to you to make the character interesting. You have a blank template, so you're not falling back on, say, this elven lineage where people expect you to act and behave a certain way because you're an elf. Your character gets to be truly unique, more so than any of the other races, because there's no pre-bias against you. I'm not saying you can't have an interesting character who's not a human, that's not what I mean at all. I just find it interesting to create my own tropes so people don't assume things but the character based on their race. That said though, I think all the other races have something to bring to the table in D&D, and I think they're all unique and interesting in their own way, except for gnomes. I hate gnomes, and nothing will ever change my stance on that. Also, I just want to throw it out there, a very close runner-up for my favorite race choice would definitely be the Dragonborn. I think they're awesome, and who doesn't want to play as a dragon? Moving on to the next question. Rock Lobster on Discord asks, how do you handle the PC afterlife? It's funny you bring that up because if you are up to date on the Campaign Diaries video, you will know that I just had to deal with the PC afterlife for a couple of my players. My school of thought on this is very much that I don't want to show too much to the players, but I want them to know that the Elder Planes kind of exist and something's going on there. So generally what I'll do after a player's character has died and they've had their final moments and all that stuff is done, they appear in what is essentially purgatory, they meet the personification of death who essentially asks them if they're ready, they might be able to ask some questions to him about the world or their friends or what's going on, and have a bit of a dialogue with death, literally, and then he kind of takes them away beyond the veil into whatever afterlife awaits them, and that's where we essentially drop the curtain on that. That said, they're not forced to go into the afterlife. Death is like, hey man, time is irrelevant here. You can go now or in a bajillion years. It makes no difference to me. And in the last couple sessions I had, I actually had one of my players who say, yes, my character's not going to the afterlife. He's just chilling in purgatory forever until his friends can bring him back because he knows that's what they're going to do. And that was fine. I said, sure, you can hang out in purgatory as long as you want. It's not like there's a lineup to get out of here. It's literally just you in your own personal plane of existence before you pass on. Now, when it comes to actually showing them the afterlife, oh, you went to the plane of Mount Olympus or wherever, I don't really reveal that to the characters right away. The only time that's revealed is if the rest of the party goes and tries to initiate contact with that dead player. For example, in the last game that we had, they wanted to speak with the two PCs who had died to figure out if they should try to bring them back or not. Of course, when they talked to Ren, who was in purgatory, he was like, yeah, what are you guys even talking to me for? Let's go, like, get me back home. My parents can pay for it. Don't even worry about it. Get me rezzed. Um, when they talked to Karen, she, the player asked me, like, what's going on? Where am I? And I, that, it's at that point that I explained, okay, you are on the infinite forest of Elysium. You're at the frontier of essentially what is the upper plains. And you are one of the Night Sisters of Elowana. Like she has brought your noble soul to her side and kind of gave some backstory there on what was actually happening with her character's spirit now that it's passed on to the next world. She thought that it was a pretty fitting way for her Air Ganassi Ranger to end up as a Night Sister of Elowana, hunting down demons on what is essentially the borderline between heaven and hell. And thought that was pretty cool. So she was like, you know what, guys? Don't worry about it. Don't bring me back. I've got important work going on here. And then just tell my family that I said I love them and make sure my body gets to my dad. Like, that was pretty much the end of that conversation. And it was also an excellent roleplay moment for sure. But that's really the only time I will reveal what is happening in the afterlife of a specific player. My school of thought when it comes to the Outer Planes is that I generally keep it behind the curtain unless the players actually manage to travel to one of these places or initiate contact with someone who is there. The less is more approach is what works for me in my game, so that's how I generally do things. AKA Deadpool on Discord asks, is there a monster or element of a story that you try to weave into each of your campaigns? It's a very interesting choice of words you use there, and I'm not sure if that was intentional or not, but there is a specific monster I try to weave into each of my campaigns. I mentioned them earlier when someone asked me about my favorite monster, and that of course is the Spellweavers. Not every campaign I run focuses around them, not every campaign is ever going to even see one or even know they exist, 
but they are just this cosmic force that existed in like ancient prehistoric times, like pre-mortal times on the timeline of my setting, and their influence is still kind of felt throughout the world today. This might find itself in certain artifacts that have been left behind by them, or ancient temples where people used to worship spell weavers that have are just way gone, like buried underneath like 10 layers of the Earth's crust. Just that kind of thing. Spell weavers are my version of the classic ancient forgotten society. Other than that, anything that the players have done in previous campaigns that are set in my world, I try to tie those in in some way too. Not in a blatant way where it's like, oh, here's all these characters from the last game, but just the things they do have lasting impact. So if a character manages to cause a coup in a certain kingdom, if another game is taking place 600 years down the line, that's part of that world's history now, and that kingdom might be vastly different depending on who took over after the fact. I'm a huge fan of this kind of shared story world building idea. And I try to amplify that as much as I can in my games without being too obtuse about it. Moving on to the next question, from Lord of Wasps on Discord, he asks, What monster do you think is the least intimidating out of all the additions? I mean, my first impulse and the easiest thing for me to say is the Flumpf. It is a literal friendly flying spaghetti monster that doesn't really seek any harm, and I believe they survive by like eating the psionic impressions from people's dreams or something, which doesn't actually hurt you, they are just kind of there. They're like the only creature in the Underdark I can think of that is just inherently good and floats around and doesn't seek to hurt anybody. Now that seems like the obvious choice for good reason, but another monster that might surprise you I think is very not intimidating is actually the Tarrasque. Now I know if you're standing in front of a Tarrasque, it's going to annihilate you and there's no way to get around that. That's just what it does. It travels through the world and destroys cities and mountains and kingdoms and so on and so forth. And in melee combat, a Tarrasque is very scary. But the reason I don't think it's intimidating is because it's not even a monster. A Tarrasque is like a global environmental hazard. It's incredibly easy to avoid. You're never going to just end up in a fight with a Tarrasque without knowing that you're going to be in a fight with a Tarrasque. You can see it coming from like miles away. And if you need to outrun it, you have a huge head start. It's not even going to go after you necessarily. It's just wandering around causing wanton destruction. And I mean, if you can fly, then you win. You just can avoid it entirely because it has no way to get to you. The Tarrasque, I think, is one of the most overrated monsters in D&D. I think they're super cool and I love the idea of a giant Godzilla monster equivalent in the monster manual. However, I don't find they're super usable and I don't think they're actually that intimidating except for being used as a plot device. Which to be fair, has its own merits, but I don't think the Tarrasque is really that scary when it comes down to monsters that you really don't want to see put in a campaign setting. Like if two pieces of paper slip out of my DM's binder and one of them has notes about a Tarrasque on it, and the other one has notes about Mind Flayers on it. I'm more scared of the Mind Flayers than I am of the Tarrasque. Dragon Eater on Discord asks, What's your favorite D&D adventure from any edition? And tell me your top five encounters that you've created. Well, my favorite D&D adventure off the top of my head, if I had to pick one, I would probably go with the Sunless Citadel. There's a reason that I use it in almost every game that I run, it's a great introductory module, and there's a reason that Wizards decided to reprint it with their group of legendary modules in the Tales from the Yawning Portal. The Sunless Citadel, which originally I believe is from 3rd edition, is just fantastic. It gives players a lot of options for exploring the dungeon itself. It's multi-layered, multi-faceted, and you have all these cool, interesting NPCs in there, especially Meepo. Everybody loves Meepo or hates him, depending on how your DM played him. And that's what I think is so neat about it too, is it's not a long module, so you can sit down and pound this out in one long session or two shorter ones, and you end up with a really fascinating story, and I love hearing people's story about the Sunless Citadel because every single one of them is super different depending on what their group decided to do. And as for my top five encounters that I've created, that's a tough question actually because there's been many, many encounters over the years. I don't know if I can necessarily order these in one to five, but I can give you five encounters that I really enjoyed running and that have stuck with me, so that's gotta mean something. In the first campaign I ran, I actually took this idea from a post I found somewhere on the internet 
about this creature whose name was Shoggy, the seldom dog, because he was seldom a dog. He was actually a dog that was experimented on and kind of turned into this shape-shifting creature. So every so many hours you roll the couple of dice to determine if he would transform at all, and if he did, what kind of creature he would transform into, and what size he would be. And then you as the DM basically just got to decide what this dog turned into. It was very fun, and he ended up becoming a favorite NPC of the group that he was with. The biggest caveat with Shoggy, though, was that he was a total coward. He would never engage in combat, and would always run from everyone, and this was basically to avoid him being abused if, say, he turned into, like, a frost giant or something, and the party's only at level 5, he's then just gonna annihilate everybody, right? So... He had this thing where he would always try to run away and hide. The party found him as a stray because they were wandering through some swamplands and he was a frost giant actually. They saw a frost giant running away as fast as he could from two lizard folk. <laughs> and the party was very confused by this because they were like, why is this gigantic literal giant running away from two lizard folk, which are like CR one half creatures. They're not very powerful. So the party went to investigate, and this was basically the encounter. They talked to the lizard folk, found out that this frost giant wasn't what he appeared to be, and he was stealing food from them. We were like, why would a frost giant be stealing food from these lizard folk? And then, of course, they stuck around. He, Shoggy couldn't speak, mind you, when he was in a form that could speak, so he was just kind of whimpering and being scared. And he ended up transforming back into a dog at some point, and the party just took him away so the lizard people would leave him alone, and they gave him some food and adopted him into the party, and Shoggy became a fun NPC. But that additional encounter was something that I always remembered and always just thought was hilarious. I also ran an encounter with a white dragon once, where the party ended up finding an Afridi's bottle amongst the treasure, and this was all rolled for totally randomly. It actually came up that it was one of the noble genie, so the Afridi popped out and offered to grant three wishes to the player who discovered the lamp. This was a relatively new group of players, and I don't know if they were necessarily planning on being messed with wish-wise, so they just thought they could wish for whatever they wanted. And the very first thing that player did, I'll never forget this, she just screamed out, I grab the lamp and yell, I want to be a genie. <laughs> And everyone else in the party was like, no, because that's just the classic Aladdin move. You're like, don't pull a Jafar, you don't wish to be a genie. And sure enough, that player was turned into an Afridi, which we had to work out later. But this ultimately resulted in her having the basic core stats of an Afridi and a couple of the spell-like abilities that were way toned down. And she ended up with a level adjustment of like plus four, which was a mechanic from 3.5. These were my younger days of DMing. I don't like to think about it sometimes because I give myself a headache. But yes, she wished to be a genie, which was hilarious and changed a lot for that character because she was a lawful good monk who everyone thought was a lawful evil demon when they first saw her, or demon-like figure, so that was brought about some interesting roleplay elements. Also, the second thing she wished for, I think, was just everyone got a couple stat points, which was reasonable enough, so I didn't screw them over too hard on that one. And the third thing she wished for was the ability to turn into a great worm, as in an ancient golden dragon. But she instead gained a spell-like ability where once per day she could turn into a dire earthworm that allowed her to have a burrow speed of 20 feet. So that was kind of funny. That was just an encounter that stuck with me as well and I still think about it. And we talk about that and still laugh about it once in a while. In that same game later down the line we ran an encounter that was essentially the party trying to stave off a gigantic horde of zombies. And the way this came about was because there was a guy, a necromancer, who was the big bad of that campaign, and they were in this massive human city called Amity. It was like the capital of humanity. There was 11,000 people in this city. And this guy was trying to conduct a ritual to basically turn a huge portion of the population into the undead and try to take over the city. The party, unfortunately, failed to stop the ritual. So the way that I had worded this specifically in my encounter was that a percentage, literally rolled in a D percentile, of the population would be turned into zombies. And I didn't know how this was going to go. I left it up a little bit to too much random chance, I think, now that I have learned from my past mistakes. But anyways, in the moment, I was like, it's possible to only be 1%, and that's fine, whatever. It just won't work as well as the Necromancer wants it to. Long story short, I rolled a percentile, and I rolled it in front of the players, which was a huge mistake. And it came up as three zeros. So 100% of this 11,000 people in this huge city were turned into the undead. 
And I thought, oh, that's just great. And I couldn't even fudge it or take it back because I had rolled it in front of the players. So we just went with it. All the players were trapped in this insanely zombie infested capital city that they had to escape from. And it was glorious. It was a really, really fun session. I think it ended up being two sessions, actually, and uh, we had a lot of fun with it. So that's definitely up there for me as well. Another non-combat encounter that I ran that I look back on fondly was uh, in this game that I ran in 3.5. There was a character who was playing a dro elf sorcerer. He was very much your typical dro. He was moody. Everyone hated him because he was a dro. And I don't even mean just other places they went in the world. Like literally the party used to rag on him all the time in character because people just generally didn't like dro like in most fantasy settings. And this all kind of culminated one day in them actually being in a small dro settlement and his character sat down with this elderly dro sorcerer as well who he was kind of looking to maybe teach him a couple spells or sell him some magic items that kind of thing this dro elf character basically went on a rant to this older dro about how everyone hated him and it wasn't fair and he was suffering because of just the way the world is essentially and this older dro elf just sat him down and had this long talk, which was basically the equivalent of an elder scolding someone from the younger generation about how back in his day when they were still in the Underdark and all the horrors they went through as servants of Lolf before their sect of the dro were able to split off and come to the surface and just set him straight. And after that day, I mean, people still ragged on that dro character for being a dro all the time. But he kind of took it in stride and was like, you know, it could have been worse. My ancestors came from a much worse place and he used that to grow essentially as a character rather than let it define who he was. It was very interesting and it was just a fun roleplay moment because it's very rare you get to see a character actually change right before your very eyes in one scene to the next. So that was kind of fun. And to round it out at five, I think I'm going to go with the current game I'm DMing, the party encountering the Orcish tribe for the first time. I did a campaign diary about this if you want to hear about this whole session in length. I believe it's going to be the first one actually. But um, basically they met this tribe of orcs and for some reason, which I'm ever thankful for, they didn't just attack them on sight. They actually tried to converse with them, which resulted in this great sweeping epic of them helping this orcish leader regain his rightful place amongst his tribe. Just that whole initial interaction was very cool and very interesting. It was very clearly tenuous on both sides, but then Knowles attacked while they were in the dungeon and they were forced to kind of fight together to survive. And it just ultimately ended up being a very memorable encounter. So that one is one that I hold in high regard for sure. And moving on to our very last question of the Q&A from Shay once again on Discord. He asks, what is your favorite meme? This is a question I am scared to answer because no matter what I say in about two months, it won't be funny anymore <laughs> and uh, people will just be like, wow, this guy likes that meme. What a loser. If I'm being totally honest, though, of course, it changes from month to month as the freshest memes tend to do. However, I am partial to uh, I don't know what the actual meme is called, but the this guy meme. It always makes me laugh and it hasn't seemed to get old yet, despite the fact that it's been around for a while. So that one, if I had to pick right now, I would say that's probably my favorite meme. So that sums up our Q&A this time. Uh, thank you to everyone who asked a question and participated in the conversation. It was great reading all of your guys questions and answering them. I had a lot of fun making this video. And thank you to all you guys out there who are currently watching and learning all the deep, dark secrets about the Dungeon Dad lore. If you have a question that you didn't see answered in today's video and you want to ask it to me personally, uh, keep that loaded in the chamber because I'm sure we'll do another one of these in a few months down the road and uh, I'm always going to be looking for new and exciting questions. Anyways, that is all for today. So thank you very much for watching. I do appreciate it and I will see you in the next video. Till then.